Hello, and welcome to this lecture on consumer choice. In economics, we are studying uh, how people make choices. Um, Lord Robbins described economics as a study of the allocation of scarce resources. Jim Buchanan uh, describes economics as the study of uh, the process of exchange. Um, Adam Smith looks at economics as the study of uh, where wealth comes from. So the question that all these people are asking in different ways is how do people make choices? How is it uh, that they decide either how to allocate their resources, who to exchange with, um, and what constraints do they face? So today we're going to uh, set out a somewhat technical uh, way of um, looking at consumer choice. But the idea behind it is quite simple. So we're, we are going to be talking primarily about utility today. Utility is the amount of satisfaction derived from consumption. Uh, there are lots of um, other assumptions going on here, but we're going to assume primarily that people want to maximize their total utility. In other words, they, try to want, they want to try and get the most out of what uh, they have given the constraints that they face. Total utility is the total amount of utility, the total amount of satisfaction derived from all their consumption choices. But uh, because economics is thinking on the margin, we're going to be concerned primarily about here marginal utility. For the additional utility, the additional amount of satisfaction provided by one additional unit of consumption. Margin is always one additional more. Um, so Marginal utility, mathematically, is defined as the change in, uh, change in total utility over the change in quantity. So how much is that one uh, change in quantity affecting your uh, total utility? Uh, what this implies is marginal utility can be negative um, if your total utility starts to fall as you consume one, uh, one more item. It doesn't have to be positive. Um, so let's start putting all this together. Recall the budget constraint. Jose here in our example, he has $56. And he is trying to decide how he's going to allocate his budget of $56 between movies and t-shirts. Uh, he can buy, he can go to uh, one movie, buy one movie essentially at $7, or he can buy one t-shirt at $14. Given his budget, how can Jose allocate his resources, in this case his income, uh, in order to maximize his total utility? That's the ultimate question here that we're assuming. Now, of course, in real life, there's more than just two options. Um, they don't have to be terms of, uh, in terms of consumable goods of movies and t-shirts. You could be trying to allocate your love budget between uh, you know, your, your mother and your father or your uh, children, which is of course not to say that you have a favorite parent or a favorite child or anything like that, but you have only so much time and energy uh, and you do make some implicit choices on how you're going to spend it and who you're gonna uh, spend it with. So uh, if you wanna try and make this more, mm, more amiable while at the same time uh, cheapening family relationships on the y-axis instead of movies it could be son and uh, on the x-axis instead of t-shirts it could be daughter and you're trying to allocate your hours. Um, of course again people don't actually do this they don't sit down and calculate out their marginal revenue uh, or uh, marginal utility but this is just simply a process, our way of trying to think about how people behave and explain uh, the outcomes that we, uh, that we do see in real life, the empirical outline, outlines, outcomes. So if Jose is trying to maximize his total utility, then uh, mathematically that is going to be where the marginal utility per dollar of good one, in this case movies, is equal to the marginal utility per dollar of good two, in this case t-shirts. What that means is one 
additional consumption of a t-shirt is going to bring him the same utility as one additional consumption of a movie. Um, we can show this mathematically, but again, it involves calculus. I don't want to do calculus. You don't want to do calculus. Uh, if you are interested in a proof of that, uh, there are lots of videos out there that will go through, um, go through that. I'm not going to worry about the purposes of these lectures, and neither should you. Um, for Jose to maximize, he is going to consume movies up to the point where the consumption of one additional movie brings him less marginal satisfaction than the consumption of one extra t-shirt, or vice versa. We can say the same thing since this is uh, an equality solution. We can say that the consumption of one extra t-shirt nets him the same utility as one extra movie. I will sometimes refer to this as the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. It's the same sort of idea. What you have to give up is roughly equal to what you're getting. And at this point, uh, total utility is maximized. I'm not going to go through uh, an in-depth mathematical example of this. Um, your book, uh, the OpenStax textbook, uh, has uh, an example. Rather, I want to focus here on just understanding the intuition. And the intuition is simply this. Is this consumption of one more unit going to make me at least as satisfied as my alternative uses? What is the trade-off that we're facing here? What are the costs that we're facing here? <clears throat> so this starts to give us some mathematical intuition on why demand curves slope downwards. Since goods are scarce, trade-offs must be made. If there was absolutely no scarcity anywhere in the world, including time, Jose could maximize his total utility to infinity by simply consuming whatever it is um, that has the highest uh, utility. But he faces a budget constraint, he faces time constraints. That necessarily means that demand curve starts to slope downwards. And since all of these are also relative prices, relative to one another, two effects come into play when uh, pri relative prices increase or decrease. There's an income effect. If the price of, say, movies were to increase uh, and Jose's budget does not increase, his income does not increase, then the relatively higher price of movies means that in uh, reality, the purchasing power of his income has fallen. So even uh, with no change in utility and no change in the price of t-shirts, an increase in the price of movies necessarily means that uh, he's going to have lower quantity demanded. But at the same time, there's also a substitution effect going on. Uh, when the price of a good rises, people will look for substitutes. Maybe instead of buying a movie, uh, Jose instead buys a book. Or maybe instead of buying a movie, Jose decides to go to uh, the theater or something like that. Uh, higher prices cause uh, people to start to search for substitutes. These two effects happen at the same time. Uh, it's not an income effect or a substitution effect thing. Sometimes uh, the substitution effect may overwhelm the income effect and sometimes vice versa. Uh, but these effects are always happening at the same time, giving us a downward sloping demand curve. And uh, we can see this intuition uh, looking at uh, the budget constraint, which is the top panel he top panel A here, versus uh, the demand curve, which is the bottom panel B here. Um, what we're seeing here in uh, panel A is an increase in the price of housing over time. The original budget constraint is this line here. As housing increases in price relative to everything else, you can now afford less housing um, at, uh, than you could in the past. So from M1 or M0 to M1 here, we can see that the quantity demanded of housing falls from Q0 to Q1 here, and same as the price uh, continues. Um, we draw a line through all these various points, and we start to develop 
a uh, demand curve for housing. Lots of things, of course, come into effect here. This is a very simple example, but uh, we're showing the, de the, de uh, the development of demand curves from simply the budget constraint. And the budget constraint comes about because resources are scarce. So this is uh, the rough idea, the beginnings of the ideas of how consumers uh, make choices. They attempt to maximize their marginal utility given the constraints that they face. And this leads us uh, to, the, to the development of the demand curve and as we'll see in the next lecture, the development of the supply curve as well. 